Before we get into today's episode of the People Property Place podcast, I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to the show. I get so much energy from sitting down with all these amazing people across our space, driving change um, and having a platform to share their views, stories, opinions, and career journeys. We live in a fascinating time where there's volatility, there creates opportunity. And uh, I'm excited to see how, as an industry, uh, the industry navigates some of the key hurdles, challenges um, that we are all facing. Thank you to those of you who have uh, dropped me a message on LinkedIn to say hi or to um, share recommendations of guests that I should get on the show. If you haven't done that already, do drop me a message. I'd love uh, to hear from you. And if you um, could do a very small favor in return for listening to this podcast, if you could share it with a couple of friends, colleagues, or those that you think could get some value from it, it would mean the world. Looking forward to uh, launching this next episode. Uh, Hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed recording it. There's going to be a huge change. Uh, both in the owners of real estate over the next three years as people are having to deal with the problems they've had to come to terms with. But also, as we know, there's going to be some challenges to the office sector that is being um, challenged, not not existentially, but secondary offices are going to be less needed. So being able to find new interesting uses for those things really excites me, creating inspiring places and actually really making a difference to Britain, which may go global again, may go to the world, um, and helping people to get on their lives. So having a real estate business that's all about the talent of the future, that's what excites me. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, we are joined by Robert Wollstone Home founder of Trilogy Real Estate, LLP, a UK-focused investment and development management business he set up in 2015. Robert is a charismatic, creative, and ideas-driven founder, and a top thought leader in the education and innovation real estate space. He started his career at JLL before moving to Resolution Property, latterly as investment director. He has a degree in architecture from the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, and a qualification in chartered surveying, as well as a diploma in finance from the Securities Institute. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Not at all. Well, look, I'm really excited to see where our conversation goes today. Um, I know that you're in a very exciting and growing part of the real estate industry, and I'm really keen to find out a little bit more about that space. Um, But a question that we always like to start uh, here on the podcast is, how did you get into real estate? Ah, well, um, from school days, like many people, not being too sure what I wanted to do, I thought maybe hotel management looked like a glamorous thing to do. Uh, Then I worked for a month in a hotel and realized it wasn't quite as glamorous as I thought it was going to be, but was kind of taken with the real estate side of that. Um, And I was half reasonable. That's probably being reasonably generous to myself at maths and art and thought, well, for university, perhaps architecture would be an interesting degree. So somehow got my way in to UCL, to the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, Started off in that with, I would say, a lot of enthusiasm for that. Uh, But then began to become a little bit disillusioned by my future life as an architect and thought, "Mm, is it the architects that really make the decisions about buildings and the built environment? Or is it the people with the money? Um, And concluded that the people who could really have creative fun and make a difference were the people who controlled the money, the clients. And so decided that I would try and find a route through to becoming, inverted commas, a real estate client. I didn't know what it was. I'd never heard of chartered surveying at that time. Um, I went to the careers library at UCL, and they pointed to a dusty shelf at the bottom of the library, which had 
the Chartered Surveyor Weekly magazine that was very old and out of date and the Estates Gazette. They said, we think for property, you need to look at that. And looked at these magazines and just thought it was just Pandora's box of fun. And in those days, because I was at UCL, I could cycle around Hanover Square, which seemed to be where everybody was, and saw these glamorous looking businesses. There was one called Knight Frank that had a very old fashioned building. There was this Helium Baker. There was Debenham, Chews and Chinooks. There was still Bernard Thorpe. And then there was Jones Lang Wooten that had a marble lined lobby with goldfish in the lobby and all these international signs behind the, behind the reception desk. I thought, this looks interesting. I just dropped a letter. Have you got any jobs? And uh, somehow got onto their interview program in 1988 and stayed there for 14 years. That was how I got into it. So no family background? Absolutely none at all. No understanding of it at all. My dad was in industry. Uh, he started his life at ICI and then went into, I guess, loosely related industrial products like carpets and, and ceiling tiles and things like that. Um, he spent a bit of time working in America. Uh, my mom was an occupational therapist, uh, which is kind of creative. Uh, that's kind of helping people out. And, and I guess from a childhood, I had this sort of creative bit from mum and maybe industry and business bit from dad. Um, and then if I go back to my grandparents, they all came from Manchester. They're all really in the, um, in the textile industry. And I saw two sides of the family. One side actually did very well, very prudent, very successful. Um, the other side, the other, the opposite end. It all went wrong. And I suppose that gives me this sort of inner chip of half optimism, but half extreme kind of worry. Um, there's a strong worry chip, people who know me, um, which I think people who do worry in business are probably the people you don't need to worry too much about if you know they're worrying about things. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, you need to understand risk. Until it gets crippling, right? Because worrying isn't a proactive feeling. Sure, of course. Um, you need to balance the worry and the worry about risk with excitement about the thing you're creating. Um, and if you can get a sort of balance between those things, you're in... You're in a pretty good place. I tend to be possibly a bit extreme, but I get a bit over excited sometimes and then maybe over worry at other times. And then finding the balance between those is, is where I like to be. So you landed at um, what is now called JLL. Yeah. Spent 14 years there. Yeah. What, you know, did you, you got your letters, your M MRICS? Well, uh, I started off going into the valuation department thinking, oh, this isn't quite what I thought this industry was about. Um, sent off with my rod and tape to measure, as I remember it, a kind of Indian f um, clothing sweatshop, as I saw it, in, the, in the, the wrong end of Croydon. I just thought, have I done a degree to go and measure sweatshops in Croydon? Is this what I'm left going to be doing for the rest of my life? And then iron rope works, steel rope works all around the country and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And I, yeah, that first year of valuation, it wasn't really me, but it was a good grounding in, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, having to really work up your compar comparables and ring round and graft. Then I thought, oh, I want to go into investment. Everybody always wanted to go into investment in these firms of surveyors. And Jones Lang said, no, you're not lad, you're going to go into management. And I thought that would be a fate worse than anything. Um, thinking I was absolutely going to hate it. We rather rudely called it bog roll collection and bog, bog roll management. Um, actually, as it turned out, that management, it was probably one of the best jobs I ever had. I absolutely adored it because I was kind of left to get on and run buildings and could make a difference to, in a little way to office receptions and, uh, and, and talking to occupiers and seeing whether we could do interesting things with invest for investors and clients. I had a lovely time. Then after that, I was a bit of le leasing, a little bit of leasing, um, which then led to investment. Um, and in those days, I hit the investment department right at the bottom of the cycle. 
it couldn't have been a worse time to hit it. But I guess, so I guess in some ways that's a good thing. It meant that you were seeing people being made redundant across the industry. It was in 1990 and you just had to get your head down and graft. And you knew that, you know, any minute now it could be your, your head on the chopping block. So you just grafted. Um, and I actually had a wonderful time. I stayed at Jones Lang probably longer than I'd intended to because I'd always thought I wanted to be a developer rather than an advisor. But I had 14 years, saw through from 19, well, 1988 to 2002, did some fantastic things, really specialized in those days in the office world, and also became um, the point man between corporates and institutions. So the likes of sort of BP, Microsoft, Cisco, talking to them about, in those days, wanting to take properties off balance sheet and looking for ways to do that, working with institutions who are keen to do sale and leasebacks and seeing how we could do things creatively for corporates. And I was fascinated by that and made many trips to the States with both institutions and corporates. So we're there with BT and BP and legal in general, um, Worked quite a lot in those days with Stanhope um, as well. And we made these trips to America, to New York and to San Francisco. And then we looked at Atlanta and other places just to see what trends were coming across from there. And that was all in the time of the dot-com boom in the 90s. Particularly in the late 90s, we were getting quite excited by the dot-com boom. I witnessed firsthand in San Francisco this move from sort of Palo Alto, um, out of town, these office parks, to people suddenly thinking, actually, it's more interesting to be in a city center. And it was kind of odd. There was this area called South of Market, which had banged out old warehouses covered in graffiti. And you could tell that these companies were coming out of Palo Alto because they wanted to have old warehouses. We hadn't really seen this in the UK. In those days, it was Stockley Park, Thames Valley Park and all these out-of-town office parks with great car parking ratios, and that was the way it was. Um, and um, witnessed this move for the sort of dot-com generation to want to be in these kind of gritty, creative neighborhoods of cities. So I sort of followed that zeitgeist um, and got to know Resolution as a... They were my client, really. They had done mostly... Um, shopping centers, secondary shopping centers, reinventing them, managing them. Um, and they'd stumbled into this world um, in, with a building called Greater London House up at Mornington Crescent in Camden and decided to have a go. Um, and yeah, our lives came across each other. They had then done some industrial. Um, and I guess I worked with them for probably three years buying for them, buying from them, selling for them. And it went incredibly well for them. And it was a sort of two times cash multiple working with a private equity group called Warbur Pincus, who were the main backer. And I, I got fascinated in what they were doing. And I could see that actually this could be a really, really interesting place for a creative outlet. And we sold in 2001, just before the music stopped and the dot-com boom, a whole load of offices to Blackstone. And we looked at, and Blackstone, nobody had heard of then. They'd done one deal in the UK where they owned a few hotels. That was it. It was a sort of office with two people, John Cookrell and Chad Pike. Um, and they bought this portfolio. And we began to look at their business model, which was this, you know, they bring in, groups of different investors from around the world in this sort of limited partnership structure. Um, and uh, the guys at Resolution said, well, why don't you come out of Jones Lang and come and join us and we'll see whether we can have a go at doing that. So that's what I did. Um, that was really fascinating. Loved it. Uh, and so after 14 years, you kind of landed in a place that you wanted to access when yeah. you first got into real estate yeah. or when you kind of pivoted out of architecture you're like you found where you uh, where you wanted to be yeah absolutely um and uh arrived the brilliance about it was that warbur pincus were still supporting the business 
they supported it with, as I remember it, a commitment of $200 million. So it wasn't a complete jump into the unknown of nothing. There was some security there that, that appealed to my risk-averse chip. Um, and supporting the businesses in £200 million to go and deploy and buy further assets? Yes, 100%. The idea then was UK. We're going to do UK uh, opportunistic. Very specifically, not to have any particular theme, but go and find opportunities. Go and dig out diamonds in the rough, wherever it comes from, and be prepared to play the cycles. Um, and as I was shifting from Jones Lang into uh, Resolution, uh, the guys had stumbled across a large portfolio of things that had nothing to do with the UK, or really my sector, which was retail warehousing in Sweden. Uh, and there was a very large portfolio of retail warehouse parks in Sweden, which were viable, as I remember, at an 8% yield off rents of £7 a foot, at a time in the UK where yields were 5% and rents were going through £25 a foot. And we said, that just seems cheap. And they're all next to Ikea's. And the more we looked into it, the more we just thought, maybe they've missed a trick. Um, so we were able to buy it with the support of Warbo Pincus, which actually then led to us thinking about the UK post the dot-com crash. And where did we feel the best value was? And oddly, it wasn't the sector that I knew best, which was offices. It was retail. And so my first deal was to buy a shopping centre in Wakefield. Um, and buying two interests from two joint owners who'd stopped really talking to each other, which gave us an opportunity. And the timing couldn't have been better. 2002, buying a shopping centre for, I think it was a 7.5% blended yield. And within 18 months, the yields had compressed to 6%. So we did a little bit of asset management, but not a huge amount. Yields had dropped values had risen. We'd borrowed a fair amount. We were able to borrow in those days. We borrowed 75% thinking we were being very prudent. Um, so it meant that we doubled our money in no time. Um, and the Swedish portfolio tripled its money. And we did some other deals that just went incredibly well. And along that journey in the first few years at Resolution, we went out. I, Robert Lawrence and I went to America and peddled our narrative and our story. And we found some fantastic investors in the US endowments of the big Ivy League universities who were prepared to back us. Um, and uh, again, with this opportunistic strategy, guys, just go and see what you can find. Um, and timing's everything. I had no idea when I left Jones Lang that the period 2002 to 2005 was a kind of golden period to be investing in real estate. It was. It was a golden period, um, maybe up to 2006. And then we'd done incredibly well, um, and we were able to raise a significantly bigger fund by the end of 2007. And context here, you know, you've got retail, office, yeah. and industrial. That, that, that's really... You know, diamonds in a row. That's what you're focused on. Yeah. Right? That was the investable yeah, universe. Yeah, we didn't do beds. We didn't do alternatives. Um, we were really playing with the, yeah, retail, office, and industrial. Absolutely, completely wrongly, we sort of sold out of industrial and didn't follow on with that. Um, there was a feeling then that the kind of, tenants that we were dealing with industrial were always kind of startups and they'd just go bust and the rents never really went beyond about four pounds a foot it always been four pounds a foot and when yields went lower than nine percent we were saying it's just so expensive and so we focused on retail and then we moved into office from 2004 um it just we just played looking really uh in the city and the West End, and managed, I managed to buy a, a very large empty office in 2004, which then led to a string of office deals that we bought in the city, 
and again, we we were with the benefit of hindsight, we were lucky enough to be playing in a financial services boom. And everything we were buying, the yields were compressing quite quickly. And we'd come up with added value angles, but we really didn't need to or have time to do added value angles because the values were increasing. We'd borrowed quite a lot of money and we were able to get fantastic returns for our investors. And we began to smell trouble, I think, in around the beginning of 2007. And the world hadn't quite woken up to the trouble then. There was a sort of Northern Rock issue but Lehman's was still not even thought of as a problem. In fact, we were borrowing money from Lehman's then. Um, but we began to smell it, began to worry that the market was topping out. And so we sold out of everything. And we were in the middle of some acquisitions that we didn't want to be seen to be pulling out of. So we bought other investors in and we sort of moved them on. We could just smell the risk coming. And thankfully sold everything by August 2007. How do you smell the risk? It's a really good question. It's, I can tell you how you don't smell the risk is by investing in things that are a long way from home where you, aren't, you don't really have your ear to the ground. And we were invested in pan-European retail by that stage. And we done our Swedish thing that had gone well. Then we went to Spain. Then we went to Germany. Then we went to Portugal. And I concluded that, rightly or wrongly, we had not really been able to smell the risk in time. We were still kind of in love with our own brilliance in the sector. And we'd sort of not really admitted to the tidal wave that was coming against retail. In the UK, kind of knowing everybody everywhere, every time you go out for a coffee or a lunch, you're chatting to people, you're listening to stories of what's going on, you're hearing things just ahead of the curve. I mean, going back to 2000 and maybe in 99, Resolution at that stage had invested a lot in the sort of dot-com office sector. And the way they smelt the risk was not by talking to real estate people who are still in love with the boom, boom, boom of the sector. It was by knowing Warbo Pincus, who a private equity company invested in the very businesses who were, who were supposedly fueling this boom. And they were able to say to us, look, despite the hype, what you need to know is that we know these businesses have got maybe one or two months left in their balance sheet to survive, and they're going to start going bust. You guys need to get out of it. It was really a really good um, early warning signal. So I think that one of the lessons that I learned is you have to be, this is an American term, inch wide but mile deep in your subject matter. As opposed to what we did at Resolution, which was a, a perfectly decent strategy, but it tended to be mile wide, inch deep. Um, we had to be jacks of all trades across everything, um, which meant that we spent a lot of time sort of exploring different things, often that came to nothing, and never really, really getting in deep into a topic. But we, we, with some exceptions. So I had expertise in the UK market, expertise in offices. And so I kind of followed that. And we... By that stage, had a colleague in who was an expert in pan-European retail. And he followed that and did very well out of factory outlets in France and, and Germany. And we did very well out of our factory outlets. More conventional retail, we did less well in. Um, and I suppose that's what led to me concluding sort of lessons from the, uh, certainly the 2007, 2008 problem was inch wide, mile deep knowledge in your market. For me, that was the UK at the time, and it was kind of office oriented. And don't go playing too often in different sectors. Um, and, um, and I felt a sort of deep sense of responsibility to the investors that were investing with us, 
that I should not be responsible for investing their money in countries I didn't know, in markets I didn't really understand. Um, and that's what led to me deciding to set up Trilogy. Um, Resolution by that time had found a very significant Chinese investor that wanted a pan-European strategy. And that just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. Um, I was probably having a midlife crisis as well. And I wanted to have a go at doing my thing my way. Um, so that, that I did. You, just before we come on, come on to that, you, you mentioned you bought some offices in, in the east part of London. Can you just talk to me about the evolution of that journey and um, you touched on professional service firms, how it became much more creative and how maybe that yeah. spot, you know, you spotted that, okay. that trend at that stage. Because that, that feeds into Trilogy as well. And yeah, part of the story, and that's right? really interesting. So come 2008, after Lehman's went down, all of our American investors would say to us, hey guys, honestly, do you really think you should be investing in London office? Because isn't London and the UK really only about one thing, which is financial services? And as we see it, this is post Lehman going down, that industry is going to be really thwarted for, for years. Why don't you just focus across the channel on Europe? We'd feel much more comfortable with you doing that. So I took that as a bit of a provocation and said, well, okay, before we just completely give up on London, why don't we just, I'll do it, I'll, I'll work with the, my colleagues to write a thesis for London. And I concluded what I wanted to do was have somebody in my little working group that was not in real estate, not a property person, but who had a big world view. And there was a guy called, he's still around, Professor Tim Congdon, one of Maggie Thatcher's wise men, who had written a report for the City Corporation about the future of the city in about 2002. And the, his message then was, don't worry, the city will reinvent itself. It always has, it always does. It finds a way of reinventing itself. And this was kind of after the dot-com boom, which had been an existential crisis then. So I said, Tim, could you come and rerun that? I'll pay you to do it. And, and his thesis that he, he did said, well, for the first time in my career, and he was, he'd been around a long time, a macroeconomist, monetarist. He said, for the first time in my career, I actually am now worried about financial services. I am worried about what this is going to do to financial services. He kind of predicted banker bashing and predicted the fact that all these risk-weighted assets would be um, would have to be increased, which would mean that banks would find it hard to make money. They'd have to charge much higher interest rates than they have done they'd ever done before to survive. He was worried about it, and he said, "On top of that, I can see that all the boroughs around the city are now trying to get in on the act, and the shard was emerging out in Southwark." And you could see kind of areas around Hackney were beginning to kind of evolve. And then there was Canary Wharf competing. So we, so we said, okay, so should we not invest in London anymore? And this was in 2008. Uh, and in August 2007, he was clever enough to say, well, something's just been invented that I think will change things. And what was that? In August 2007, Steve Jobs introduced us to the world of the iPhone. The iPad hadn't quite arrived, but he said he thinks what is going to happen over the next period is that all businesses are going to be impacted by technology. And if you can follow where technology is going to be, that is an area I would invest in. And just find those areas where people who are going to be at the forefront of technology will want to be. Well, because I'd lived the dot-com boom and I'd seen south of market moves, I spent my time looking for that zeitgeist. And I concluded that the zeitgeist of the sort of digeratis, the technology folk, was closely aligned to creativity. And you could see, okay, well, the creative economy and the tech and the digital economy want to be together. 
And so we looked for the intersections of those two places. And the first place was Soho. Uh, and started off in Soho, uh, top end of Wardour Street, bought a very tired building from the Crown Estate, and they were focusing on Regent Street. It was a group of buildings, um, uh, all office buildings, that we started to think about how we could sort of reposition them for the creative economy. Um, we were pretty early in on the idea of mixed use, so bringing residential to create a sense of place as well as office. Um, and um, we bought it We bought it a little bit early, March 2008. It went down in value. Uh, we were in negative equity, but we, we kind of stuck with it. And we came out and doubled the money in the end. It was good. Um, saw how cyclical London could be. We, we'd underwritten it, I think, off rents, expecting we'd get rents of £60 a foot. Saw that in the worst, darkest times, they went down to sub-30 in Soho. But then as they climbed back up, we could see that there was a trend for the creatives to be priced out of Soho when rents hit £45 a foot. Um, and we asked ourselves, where are they going? And went on this search for them, talking to talking to our leasing agents. You know, where are all those post production studios moving to that are being priced out? Um, and the conclusion then was Clerkenwell. But I took, took a look at Clerkenwell, and so it's very. I can see it's very cool. Um, but the rents are already forty five pounds a foot. Where next? And there was this area that was just called City Fringe. Nobody really gone there. It was not a place that people went. You kind of, it felt a bit dangerous. Um, and certainly the, the backlands. Uh, and then I had some young guys who are great friends um, working with me. One's now at KKR, Charles Tutt. The other is Jacob Loftus, who's now got his own business, General Projects. And they were the youth there working with me. And they would say, no, this, this is Shoreditch. This is super cool. I've never heard of Shoreditch. Um, and we started looking around. We had <clears throat> a lot of money to deploy. Um, and all the buildings were a bit small. You could do three million pound building there or a five million pound building in another place. We said, we just can't, we've, we've got to deploy a billion. We can't do that. It's too granular. Too, too granular. Small, too intense. And then this building that was clearly in some sort of receivership situation came up, which was called Triton Court. Um, and Actually, to people in the city, it was seen as a kind of edge of city thing on Finsbury Square. It was a bit edgy and maybe the rents, you might get to £40 a foot one day, but at those days it was worth 35 not a penny more. And everybody's saying to me, all my old Jones Lang colleagues saying, be careful, you're in the boons. Well, that was approaching it from Finsbury Square. If I approached the building from Worship Street, directly opposite the loading bay door was a Banksy graffiti piece on the wall of this building. And I said, there's something about this Shoreditch area that I feel the zeitgeist is at. I'm sensing that South of Market and later Meatpacking District, New York, zeitgeist right there. So her house had opened up down, um, down in Shoreditch uh, in the T building. And I started becoming a tour guide for Americans. Come over, come over, come over. Why don't you take to this, take to this place? And we go for a pizza at Pizza East and walk up Great Eastern Street and into those areas. And they say, yeah, we love this. This is great. Had to be patient. But we bought a couple of buildings, all cash, no debt. Um, one was on Bond Hill Street, which became, it was opposite where the Google campus was. We were in there before anybody knew Google were going to be going there, which was great. Um, and then we bought Triton Court, which we transformed into what became Alpha Beta. And freehold building we bought for £200 a foot, off receivers, um, and all about the timing. Uh, and that was great. Uh, it happened to be buying it at exactly the right time, in the cycle, at exactly the right moment. I was there in the right place at the right time. And we saw the rents rising through 45, through 55, through 65 pounds a foot. To me, that was a sell moment. Move east again. 
to Whitechapel. We could see that the um, Crossrail was coming down there and bought an old knackered derelict department store called the Wickham's Department Store at one end of Mile End Road. And I, I remember when we first went around it, there was a, there was a dead pigeon on the floor. And I said to Jacob, that's a sign. That's a good sign. Because when we bought Greater London House years ago at Mornington Crescent, we used to talk about the building being banged out and dead pigeon being on the floor. I said, that's it. We'll buy this building. It was something like 250 pounds a foot. Um, and we'll find a way. And everybody, there was a lot of nervousness with my colleagues. Said, Do you realize what Mile End Road looks like? You can't be serious. This is going to be the flagship deal in a new fund, and we're going to be taking people out. And it's a, a, a an extremely multicultural area with kind of street markets out in the streets. So yeah, let's do it. Worked out brilliantly. Um, and um, so that that sort of move from Soho to Shoreditch to Whitechapel was something that I enjoyed. And looking at the global trends of what was happening in the US how New York had gone from Midtown to Soho to Meatpacking, Lower East Side, and then hopped across the river to Brooklyn. What well, is this place, Brooklyn? This looks exciting. This looks to me where the creative Dumbo. zeitgeist is. Dumbo. Yeah, exactly. Dumbo. I was there in those early days. And then in, it, back in San Francisco, looking at it's flicking over to Oakland. So, okay, so what happens is people need to move to where they can afford to live, it's looking for where the creative zeitgeist is. It's usually the artists are going to go to where they can afford. Um, so that's what I started to follow again. Um, and that's, it was at that moment that I started Trilogy. And so you left Resolution, having done a couple of very interesting deals and had a very good career there. How... Mm. How did the idea for kind of trilogy come up? You know, clearly at that stage, there would, you, you know, I don't know from a personal perspective, but there would have yeah. been risks associated with it. Yeah. How did you fund the business and, and how, what was your thesis at that, that particular stage in terms of or the business plan? The thesis grew out of the lessons learned, which were inch wide, mile deep, focus on your own market, UK. That was you, thesis number one. Thesis number two was having gone in for some geographical specialism. Can we mitigate risk by being a, a little bit um, diversified amongst uses? Some of the th lessons I'd learned through what became the Ampersand building was the, the thrill of doing a bit of Oxford Street retail combined with some office, combined with some residential. So mixed use felt like an interesting thing, probably with a theme around offices, which went back to my career from day one. And the theme around offices was really the war on talent and having to try and choose those locations where the talent of the future could afford to live and work and play. Um, and I, after we'd done Whitechapel at Resolution, I had had some experience in Manchester. Um, one, one experience had been less great, bought the Printworks, a leisure center, um, just a, a bit early. Um, we managed to break even uh, rather than lose money, which was great. Um, but having got to know Manchester pretty well, I realized there was this emerging area where I could see the same types of people that were hanging around in Shoreditch. You know, the, the classic hipsters were there with the tattoos and beards and they were hanging around this area called Peter Street and I managed to buy what I considered to be a failing leisure asset called the Great Northern Warehouse, which was six acres of Manchester. And I, I, people were beginning to talk about this term, the Northern Powerhouse. And I thought, well, that feels to be to be an interesting thing. And, and again, observations from America, I was seeing people beginning to move from the New Yorks and the San Francisco's to the Austins and, and, and other areas. So you, there is an opportunity in these maybe second tier cities that have got some potential. And so acquired in partnership when I was at Resolution, this thing called the Great Northern Warehouse. And the partner was a Hong Kong investor I'd met, um, a, a company called Peterson, family called the Young Family. 
Um, and what I could see was the asset may take quite a long time to sort out. We had tenants in there, leisure tenants and car parking tenants who had over 10 years on their lease. So maybe we'd be able to move them on and persuade them to move, or maybe we wouldn't. And that, uh, so we joint ventured that when we're at Resolution. As I left Resolution, the guys at Resolution decided that was a risk that they didn't want to hold on to, that they might not be able to move the tenants on. And I said, well, I still think it's a great asset. It was 600,000 square foot of space. We were buying it less than construction cost. Some iconic buildings, including a beautiful grade two star listed warehouse. The planning authority saying, look, if you do meat packing district here, we'll give you consent to build Manhattan behind. So I knew there was a business plan that would be supported to effectively co-join meat packing and Manhattan in Manchester in the best location in, in Manchester, certainly right by Spinning Fields. It's now emerged as kind of position A. Um, but you just need a bit of patience. So I started working with this family office who, who had no... Who were the equity? Who were the equity? resolution on that particular deal? Yeah, well, they, no, we, we went in jointly. Fine. So it was, a, it, was, um, it was kind of a 50-50 with resolution and Peterson. And then as I left... Um, Part of the leaving was um, some support from the young family to say they would love to work with me, which is very flattering, and love to do this UK only thing. And they thought maybe I had been a little less bold than I could be. They were big believers in the UK. Um, and that seemed like an interesting idea. Um, and at the same time, my old friends from JLL who'd formed LaSalle Investment Management were saying, why don't you come over here and help us with, um, with LaSalle Investment Management? And then there was another family office in East London I got to know very, very well who said, why don't you come over here and do this? So I was a bit, in some ways, spoiled for choice. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could actually create a business that could actually enable me to work with all three? Um, trilogy uh <laughs> hence the name <laughs> yeah the name came out of um a bit of that a bit of the fact that in business i i tend to overcomplicate things and and the way i try and simplify my everything i do is i'm always saying i've got to try and simplify everything to the top three points and i drone on about that to myself and to my partners and everywhere i work with got to try and simplify this to the top three points um so there was that, the fact that we were hoping to work with the money of the world. Um, the money of the world was represented by the US, by Europe, and by the Far East. I wanted a vehicle that could run, work with all the three parts of the world as I saw it. Um, and I wanted a business that would be the kind of culmination of the three parts of my career. You know, I'd done my Jones Lang piece, I'd done my resolution piece, and this could be my third act. Um, so it had all sorts of different Different so you reasons. think heavily about this. I get the sense you think, yeah, long and hard and I enjoy and it. I enjoy it. Think. Yeah. And I love, um, I think probably that's come from architecture school where you really do try and look for the truth and the theme behind something um, and then let that guide you through. I wasn't necessarily that good at it, which is why I'm not an architect, but I would admire enormously an architect that could have one guiding theme through a project and it just went all the way through um, rather than flitting from here to there. It's one of my faults. I'm a flitterer. Um, so I have to try and put boundaries around myself. So it was almost a dream ticket. You had these three different parties yeah. who wanted to back you or yeah. work with you on various projects. And I guess you took the, the asset or development management uh, on for that first asset in Manchester, which kind yeah. of seeded, yeah, the, gave you the capital, the working capital to kind of build. We were able to buy that out of resolution. Yeah. And then the guys at LaSalle said, hey, we've been looking at this building or this group of buildings called East India Dock. Um, and what, have you looked at it? What do you think about it? I wasn't working for them. It was a kind of cup of, cup of coffee chat. And I said, yeah, it's, it's cheap. It looks cheap. It looks less than construction cost, which is great. Um, uh, and I don't really know what I think about it because it's kind of out there. It's kind of in the boons. But 
I'll go and have a look. And um, I went over there and was actually impressed by how easy it was to get to East India Dock. Um, it far easier than I, I thought it would be. The buildings were incredibly dull and corporate, sort of postmodern gray buildings and soulless. And it was a bit of a challenge. But um, I was able to bring my whole Alpha Beta team, the architects, the branding guys, everybody to the building. And we, we just spent some time there and thought about whether we could breathe life into this kind of soulless part of the Docklands. Um, and we started to develop a theme again. Uh, and the thesis was London's getting too expensive, too expensive for people to live in and too expensive for people to work in. Hence, I'd gone to Manchester. Yet here is part of London that's incredibly close to the West End, which is as cheap as Manchester, both to live and work. And here are some existing office buildings that the predecessor had, a, had tried to get planning permission to demolish for residential. And I said, well, why do that? They're perfectly decent buildings. They've got good bones. Can we find a way of reusing them and attracting the talent of the future to this place? And they could live at Stratford, live at London Fields, live wherever they're going to live, cycle here to work. And could this be a really interesting place where we might capture the Shoreditch exiles who are going to get priced out when those rents go over £45 a foot. Uh, and LaSalle did a load of sort of economic thinking around it as well. They could see it was the fastest growing borough in the whole of the UK um, because these populations, huge population growth, are predicted for that part of the world. Um, we sort of set about trying to decide whether you have the confidence that we could reposition it. Um, and we sort of, I did a whole lot of work around, well, what are the talent of the future thinking about? Uh, that was in 2015. And it wasn't obvious then. We hadn't heard of Greta. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and I didn't know the term ESG. Um, I hadn't even heard of impact investing. But what it was clear to me that just talking to my kids and their friends, that actually they were getting worried about what was going on with the planet. Um, and they were getting obviously worried about whether they were ever going to be able to afford to get on the housing ladder. And there were, there were some deep-seated worries there. And also, none of them really wanted to work for any banks. Banks were seen as a toxic place to work. Um, they wanted to work somewhere opposite. And there I was next to Canary Wharf. So we said, okay, what we want to do is bring in the creative zeitgeist to this place and be the opposite of everything Canary Wharf is about. And we want to do something that is going to really obviously be responsible for the planet. Not just greenwashing, but deep-seated thinking architecturally about how you could make a difference to the planet. And we decided kind of crazily that we would use timber for any, any impositions into the buildings. And that hadn't been done in the corporate environment at all then. And the guys at La Salle were very brave. And they said, oh, you really think so? They said, it looks a bit like a sauna because we'd shown a CGI of this atrium being lined with timber. And we said, trust us, it won't look like a sauna. It's going to be great. It's going to be a beautiful, crafty material. And the best thing about it is it's going to feel really different to Canary Wharf that you associate with steel and glass towers. And we know that the talent of the future aren't interested in banking. They want jobs at creative businesses. And we'll attract them in here. And we will completely reposition the public realm. First time I'd actually worked with space outside of a building as opposed to just inside a building and really thinking deeply about how we could create a place that would feel really natural. So we created water gardens with amazing planting um, and places to knock into each other, little pavilions. And, uh, and we took what was a grey, godforsaken kind of 
bus-infused, diesel-infused, polluted area and turn it into a, a beautiful water gardens with these timber-lined buildings. Absolutely fabulous. Did we attract the Shoreditz exiles? No. It turned out by that stage that the Shoreditz exiles, the people in technology, were making so much money by then they actually didn't need to follow this 45 pounds a foot thing. Uh, the creatives sure did, but they were kind of going to Margate, um, maybe up towards London Fields and towards Walthamstow, and that's what was going on. The creatives didn't necessarily come to where we were. And that made us really have to dig deep to try and work out how we were going to fill these buildings. There's a lot of space. We had 600,000 square foot of space. What do we do? And um, the first thing I did was went right into the neighborhood, which is Tower Hamlets. 50% uh, of the population is Bangladeshi. Extreme amounts of poverty. The highest rates of child poverty in the whole of Britain, right there, right in front of us. Um, and I met the local MP, Rashnara Ali, who had a really amazing charity she'd formed, um, which inspired me, called Uprising, um, which was essentially trying to mentor young kids from these poor and underprivileged neighborhoods to give them the confidence that actually jobs in banking or lawyering or chartered surveying were perfectly for them. Um, they perhaps didn't have the self-confidence that they could do them because their parents had never done them. And there's always been a feeling amongst the Bangladeshi community that those jobs weren't for them. Canary Wharf wasn't for them. Um, so why would those jobs be for them? Um, and we engaged a lot through Rashanara's charity that eventually turned to a million mentors and that led us to a charity called City Gateway. And City Gateway are into further education of 16-year-olds who've left school. The clue's in the name. It was giving them a gateway to a job. They could see the city, but they didn't think the jobs were for them. They were our first tenant, a charity. And we started to engage with them, and what they were doing was teaching. That's interesting. Seemed like a good thing. Um, we were doing something impactful. Um, great, it's a tenant, which is good news. And then along those journeys went, and we met another guy who had a, a different type of school called the Global Banking School that was teaching people from these underprivileged backgrounds banking skills, giving them a leg up in their world, often mature students in their late 20s who were looking at those gleaming glass towers and saying, how do I get into HSBC or Barclays? And he came along and said, well, I like what you've done. What you've created to me is the best campus environment I've seen in London. I'll come. Oh, great. So he came. And then we had a guy with a, with a business called London College of Accounting who'd done a deal with Anglia Ruskin University to teach accounting to students of Anglia Ruskin, and they get an Anglia Ruskin degree. And he said he loved it too. And so he took a whole big floor, 35,000 square foot, and he said, I think I'd like an option on another floor as well. I couldn't believe it. 70,000 square foot letting to an educator. Where are these people getting the, their money from? And that then got me to sort of really understand what they're about, what they're doing. And I kind of realized this is great because actually my mission was to find a place for the talent of the future. It's worked. The talent of the future is coming in droves. And one's led to another, to another, to another, and they've doubled up their sizes. They keep on coming. And I think that the we're continually told that the, the architecture that we put in there is so inspiring. The public realm is really what sold it to them. Um, it's still a little bit off beam for many people, the far end of Canary Wharf in deepest, darkest Docklands. But actually, isn't that great? Because what those universities are doing is basically trying to give a route to jobs to people. 
and Canary Wharf and the city represent jobs. And so attracting and building institutions for the future, for talent, attraction, retention, upskilling, training to enable them to go and do their best work is at the kind of the, the heart of the heart of where trilogy of- and, and where, where you are now. And also just bringing it back earlier in terms of your capital raising days when you yeah. were in the US, going and talking to a lot of these institutions and in endowment businesses. 100%. We were looking to back property. So if we fast forward to today, then, yeah. can you just give me an overview of the portfolio and how that plan has evolved and how you see kind of the yeah. future of, of Trilogy as well. Um, okay, so over the time, um, Republic has now become a, um, it's now 500,000 square foot of teaching space. We've got 20,000 students enrolled there. Um, because of the success of that, LaSalle backed us again and we bought a building in Whitechapel last year from the government that everybody else was thinking they were going to redevelop into blocks of flats or labs or offices or something. And we said, why would we do that? Let's just, it, it's an old university building. We'll just polish it up and we'll make it a university building. And by that stage, I got to know universities. So I had a tenant in Nottingham Trent University who I was looking for a building for. And so we pre-let it to Nottingham Trent we worked with an FE provider who they're very close to called Access Creative. They took another piece of the building. We've just, we're just we just PCing it as we speak. A year later, we've got the building 70% pre-let. Um, so we've done that. We are busy now uh, at Republic. Uh, we just won planning consent for 715 student rooms, um, 450 apartments, and believe it or not, a data center. Um, so now we're working on how we're going to pull the money together for that uh, because it's a very, very significant undertaking. We'll be turning what started its life as a sort of £180 million campus into a campus that will have a value of over a billion pounds, which is all about the alternatives. And our version of the alternatives, a bit different to others, is EDS, BEDS and data sheds. Um, and so that's our pivot. Um, led by Eds and our customer. And our customer is the educators of Britain um, who are creating the talent of the future. And that's what really excites us. How can we play a part in keeping Britain right at the forefront of the world's education um, and, uh, and creating mixed-use campuses? We don't want to be just about Student accommodation. Others are quite one-track minded. Student accommodation. Other people are saying labs. We're only about labs, life science. Well, actually, we talk to our customers and they say we want all three. We want student accommodation. We want some labs, but also we want research and development space for all sorts of topics. Um, And we want teaching space. And we want people that can help us through our journey, which I put down as the sort of three E's. The biggest E at the moment is experience. Everybody's worried about technological disruption in every industry. It includes education. So how do you create a human experience? Experience, massively important. ESG, massively important. Their customers are 18 to 20-year-olds who are coming out whose values are all about ESG. So that's hugely important. And thirdly, it's about economics, economic efficiency. Um, They have to um, live in a world where uh, students are becoming more discerning. If they're going to rack up 30, 40,000 pounds worth of debt going to university or more, they want to get a decent product. Um, There is some that are rebelling uh, and say, we won't go to university anymore. There doesn't seem to be an awful lot of political will to increase um, rates of fee, fee levels. Um, and so that, to me, that's all interesting. I love challenges and to see whether we can innovate and find a way to create, to keep this going. Because one thing is for sure, there is no shortage of people in the world that want to do well in their lives and want to get educated a couple of questions because you're taking these campuses that others are underwriting for real uh, for residential highest best use. How are you getting competitive in terms of your bids, and how are you making the economics stack against others who who might have a slight edge 
Yep. And also, I'm assuming mm. these these occupiers are signing leases for a very long period of time, and they're not government backed, but they're very secure in terms of the income. They're not all secure. It's as secure as you think necessarily. They're not all. Not all as secure as you think. Some of them are, um, but there are winners and losers in education. Um, they are typically with us um, signing. We're, we're getting to kind of ten to twelve year terms. They, like the old corporates that I used to do, were very nervous about the impact on their balance sheets of taking on large liabilities. The way that we can get to the returns that our investors want is by actually delving into the operations. So rather than long-term leases, actually go into the operations. And as you mentioned, um, I've got relationships with the American universities, and we have we're about we've. we've started to work with one of the very big endowments a very close friend of mine there is going to is coming in personally as an investor in the business so that we really get to the cutting edge of it we're working now with um, people who've run universities run business schools both in the uk and the us so that we really understand the operations and that is the way that we are able to kind of beat the competition um, because if you do it right in education, you can make really good returns. Um, but you've got to know where to go. You've got to know where the pitfalls are. But there are good, there are good areas, and there are people who are making an, you know, huge success of themselves at it. As you look forward, what are you most excited about? Because we're obviously in a very challenging yep. environment right now. Um, rather than dwelling on those challenges, and the downside. What, what are you excited about as we look forward? I'm always excited by change. Uh, I love it. That's where my little creative gene can get going. Um, and so the fact that there are going to be, there's going to be a huge change, uh, both in the owners of real estate over the next three years, as people are having to deal with the problems they've had to come to terms with, but also, as we know, there's going to be some challenges to the office sector that is being um, challenged, not, not existentially, but secondary offices are going to be less needed. So being able to find new interesting uses for those things really excites me, creating inspiring places and actually really making a difference to Britain, which may go global again, may go to the world. Um, and helping people to get on in their lives. So having a real estate business that's all about the talent of the future, that's what excites me. Before I ask you our final question, um, can you just talk to me about your own personal strengths and weaknesses? I think we've touched on them a little bit during this, but in terms of you know turning the mirror and reflecting, where, where are your strengths and what are you really, really good at? And what have you learned about yourself in terms of where your weaknesses are? Because I'm assuming you've got a very high-performing team. You've got people who combat some of those weaknesses and enable you to double down on some of your strengths. So I would say that probably my biggest strength is my creativity. But in some ways, my biggest weakness is my creativity. Um, and I'm the sort of person that will have 20 ideas a day, uh, different ideas, uh, and, and probably 10% of them are blinders. 90% of them are absolutely rubbish. And I have to spend my time trying to weed out the rubbish and get to the great ideas. Um, so I tend to surround myself, if I possibly can, in people who are kind of different to me. Um, so I might be a sort of creative innovator, a guy who starts something, and then I might get bored because I've got another idea. So I've got people with me who just love picking up the baton and then delivering it, uh, who I could not do without. They're fantastic. I've got other people with me who are kind of, one guy in the team is thinking about probabilities all the time. He was a, he's a, he was a Oxford scientist and he just has this natural affinity for, mm, that feels high risk or low risk. Funny, funnily enough, he's, he's got a higher propensity to risk than me. He's done more Bitcoin than me. Um, 
uh, which is which is odd because he's a lawyer, but he is the guy that's constantly just weighing up. You know, we'll write the list of the twenty ideas of the day, and then we'll say, well, which ones we're we going to bubble to the top, which ones we're we going to let go to the bottom, and where are we going to focus? So how's that? Yeah, it's a strength and a weakness. I would say that's where it's at, um, and and probably. The old fear and greed thing, which we all have, I'm quite strong on both, um, and so not allowing that to become a a kind of a, a seesaw in people's lives, and trying to sort of smooth that into something that feels reasonably calm. Um, that's it's it's a sort of weakness. I think it's probably also a strength. I'm tending to see opportunities before other, others see them and like over over the top. And then I tend to see the problems and they start to burn into me, um, perhaps more strongly than, than some of my other colleagues, but then working together to try and work through those things. Amazing. Well, look, the question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast is we wrap this up is if I was to give you 500 million pounds worth of capital who are the people what property and which place would you look to deploy uh -huh. that capital yeah well I think I've already given you this story haven't I I would definitely start in London um, it's the place I know it's what I know um, and I would try and get into the core and it may not necessarily be the classic ESG brilliant office building. Um, it could be buildings where you just create fantastic experiences for people. So as I think about it, you know, could I buy something crazy like Buckingham Palace and turn that into an amazing experiential place for young people to sort of um, create their dreams for the future? That's over the top. But um but, you know, finding characterful buildings, finding the character in buildings that will appeal to internationals. Um, I think London is always going to be a place that people want to be and playing our part in attracting these growing middle classes from the rest of the world into our country is a good thing. So that's, that's one thing I would definitely like to do. And over time, I would like to be able to take, learn these lessons to create I'll call it the university of the future and look to see where it goes globally. Cause I think it is a global thing still. Um, and could that be that we end up setting up offshoots of universities in India, um, in China, in Nigeria, quite possibly, you know, and, and across Europe, why not? And in America, why not? Um, uh, so really understanding how the world is working in this, this uh, that's where I'd like to be. And in terms of people, are there anyone outside of your team that you'd look to? Or want yeah, to bring definitely. We're looking to definitely we're looking to get more people in who've been in education, a hundred percent. So outside of real estate, outside of real estate, and then I often think I would like to get people who've got a better understanding of technology um, than me. Um, not that I want technology to rule our lives, I don't. But equally, I think you can't fight against it. You need to be with it and try to understand what kind of technological disruptions will come to education and be ahead of the game and be, be with that. Um, so those are the two areas I would like to get more people in. Well, it all comes back to people, talent attraction, retention, building workforces yep. of the future, which I'm personally very passionate about and would be uh, with my Rockbourne hat on. But Rob, you've got a fascinating background perspective experience thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your journey and uh, setting up trilogy and where you see the market and the opportunity moving forward well thank you very much for your time and i think your idea here is very inspiring too which well, is great i hope you've got a number of podcast studios in the, in the various institutions that you're building we definitely need more of them definitely need more of them we do indeed well robert thank you so much for joining me and uh, excited to see what you guys go on to do great thanks Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like, or comment. It helps tremendously. 
It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations and guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People Property Place podcast is powered by Rockborn. The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website www.rockborn.com where you'll be able to find a wealth of information or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.